Let's welcome today's brown bag. Um, I want to just tell you about the, a film that we're showing on Friday in here at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's uh, the, um, Generation Pad or Generation P, and you have about three of them, uh, based on a book by the uh, And it's going to be introduced by Ian Clues. Uh, it is unfortunately a film that we don't have English subtitles for. It. And so um, if you're in Russian, if you're studying Russian, this is a really good chance to. Uh, it's Russia, fun year. It's good practice. Good practice. Good practice. Yeah. Uh, and and Edith, uh, Dr. Please, I think is going to do a good job of sort of filling you in on what's going to be happening uh, in the film and sort of moving through it. So uh, should be good. Uh, our speaker today is our own uh, Anna Tijawa, who is a professor emerita in, in history uh, and has written uh, quite considerably on Katian, uh, including a, a book that you co-edited um, called Katian. Um, Sorry, a crime without crime punishment. Without punishment. Sorry. Uh, published in 2007, which received really uh, some excellent reviews. Uh, and in fact, uh, she received a, a Distinguished Achievement Award from the Polish Institute of Arts and Sciences uh, for her work on the book. And so I, I owe her a special uh, debt of gratitude today because uh, we had a speaker that canceled on us. Those who were following the schedule may realize that we had a, originally scheduled a, a, a lecture by Kenneth Chance uh, on the Russian Army. Uh, he canceled at uh, the very last minute and went on to realize that uh, uh, today was the anniversary, in fact, of the uh, uh, plane crash in Spain. So she stepped up. So, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize to all of you for not appearing at these meetings for such a long time. Uh, unfortunately, that, that, that was due to sickness, so severe sickness, last year. In, uh, Pneumonia takes a while to recover from that, the older you get. And so very often I just don't feel well enough before the afternoon to go anywhere. But uh, this time I feel okay, so, so that's an apology to you. Now, why speak about plane crash two years ago? Some of you may remember uh, April 10th. 2010, the Polish president and 95 other people, including many prominent officials, three heads of the, the heads of the three armed services, former president in exile, and, and many people important in that plane and it crashed on landing at Smolensk, Sibir, the airport. Very thick fog it was. And this was a terrible shock to everyone. But before I speak about it and its connection with the Katyn uh, massacres of 1940, I just want to say a little background in Polish-Russian relations. Katyn is important <laughs> in these relations, particularly for Poland, less so for Russia. There are many still unsolved questions about it. So in the um, period 205, 207, when you had a very right-wing government in Warsaw, <coughs> headed by the uh, party of, uh, which is called in English, uh, Law and Justice, Bravo is probably was a very anti-Russian government and its oil relations it had to resign in 07 because the coalition broke up. And in that government, uh, the president was one of two twin brothers, Kaczynski brothers. The president was Lech Kaczynski. And his prime minister was his twin brother, Jarosław Kaczynski. It always amuses me to think that back in the early 60s, I think 64, there was a film on Polish television. It was called The Two Who Stole the Moon. And it featured the two brothers as children. It was a story for children. Well, they stole the moon in, <laughs> in 205, but didn't hold on to it very long did manage to spoil relations uh, with Russia. Um, they seemed to improve with the new government, especially when 
President Putin came to Gdańsk, the big port city in the Baltic, on the 1st of September of 2009, the 70th anniversary of the outbreak of World War II, and actually condemned the secret protocol to the non-aggression pact, the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact, which divided Poland between Nazi Germany and Stalin's Russia. But uh, there was, of course, that had been con condemned by the Supreme Soviet in December 89, but most people had forgotten about that by that time. But there was another major thorn, even more important from the Polish point of view, in relations with Russia, and that was the Katyn massacre of uh, Polish prisoners of war by the NKVD in the spring of 1940. And I will talk, uh, show you something about that later. Uh, for about 50 years, almost 50 years, until uh, April 1990, the Soviet governments blamed the Nazis. The official Soviet thesis was the Nazis had done it, and they had done it in 1941, not in 1940, because uh, they didn't get there until 1941. Well, President Gorbachev decided finally to admit uh, Soviet guilt, and that was published in Pravda in April 13, 1990. And then we found out that there were two other sites besides Katyn, because Gorbachev handed over to then President of Poland, Jaruzelski, the lists of prisoners sent out of the three camps to the NKVD administrations of, of Smolensk and Kharkov and Tver. And there were documents published cooperating Polish and Russian editors on Katyn. Yeltsin, by the way, handed over, published in the press, the key documents of the Soviet administration, including the order of March 5, 1940. <coughs> by the Politburo, really, Stalin, to have all of these people shot. And not only the ones in the three camps, but also those who were held in jails for a total of 21,857 victims. And that's according to NKVD figures. So, a very important step here, let me see. First of all, we have a map here of the site of the crash. Um, just before the crash, there was a very important meeting of Prime Minister Tusk of Poland, pronounced Tusk in Polish, the head of the Civic Platform Party, which is a sort of middle conservative liberal party, and President Putin. And they met at Katyn on the 7th of April, and uh, made speeches. It's very interesting. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have any, didn't have time to find uh, more pictures of this. Putin actually knelt down in front of the Polish, it's a Polish and a Russian cemetery, two parts, in front of the Polish mon uh, monument to the martyr, and then Tusk spoke about it, then they went over to the Russia part, and Putin spoke about it. Putin spoke about the victims of totalitarianism, both Poles and Soviet citizens, millions of them. <coughs> so this was a, <coughs> an important step forward in, uh, in this problem, cutting problem. But then three days later, April 10th, came the crash of the presidential plane. It was a Tupolev 154, a Russian plane, which was owned by the Polish Air Force. It had been reconditioned, it wasn't new, but it was in good condition. And it crashed. Now, why did President Kaczynski decide to go to Katyn three days after the 
put in meeting with those and take so many people with you? But unfortunately, it was politics. There was a presidential election coming up in Poland. In June, in fact. The president's elected for five years. Lech had been elected in 05. And he wanted to show how many people were supporting him. In fact, not all the people on the plane were his supporters. Most were. Well, so this was uh, terrible. And uh, it gives you the distance. It's really not very far. And most of the families, relatives of the victims actually came by train. Now, what happened immediately afterwards, well, you can see the, the wreck of the plane. It's pretty bad. And it came up, it approached two or three times, I think, three times. The fog was very thick, and the instruments were not either not working very well, or some of them were not recognized. And the control tower at the airport also was a military airport. It really wasn't a, up to scratch. It was used sometimes for special occasions like this one. <coughs> and um, so the altitude was misread. But in any case, the visibility through the fog, because of the fog, was 100 meters. And a tupolev like that needs at least 400 meters visibility. Well, before I go into uh, the causes of the crash and all that, I will say that the Russians immediately expressed tremendous sympathy. Because Tusk flew up there right away and, and met with, with Putin, they even embraced. And uh, Putin arranged for the body of the president, which was identified, to be flown to Warsaw right away, instead of being flown to Moscow with the other remains for identification. And by the way, the president's brother, Yaroslav Kaczynski, or Yarek, flew up there, not exactly to Smolensk, I think he went to Minsk, and then by car. And then he came to the airport and he did not greet either Putin or Tusk. Simply demanded that his brother's remains be flown right to Warsaw. Putin complied it was. Well, before going any further, I want to make a short diversion. Because in Polish minds, Smolensk and Katyn come together. In fact, it's only a few kilometers. Smolensk is just a little bit northeast of Katyn, the place where the prisoners of Kozielsk, one of the camps, were shot. So the immediate reaction was, oh my god, is this another Katyn? What happened? And the people, a lot of people in Poland still think of Katyn as genocide that Stalin actually killed these people in Katyn and elsewhere, Polish prisoners of war and prisoners in jail, because they were Poles for ethnic racial reasons. Well, some people believe that, others don't. I, I don't. We just want to go through this. This is a meeting of, at the airport. And I want to go back to the massacre and then go on to talk the genocide. These are some of the Polish prisoners taken by the Red Army in September 1939 when they came in from the east as the Germans a little later after the Germans from the west. And they were put in three camps, not all of them, but about 14,500 uh, Kozielsk people were to be shot later at Katyn near Smolensk. The Ostashko people, who are mostly policemen and gendarmes, were shot in Kalinin or Tver, as it is called, and 
and a lot of prisoners, especially from southeast Poland, were held in Starobiask and shot in, in Kharkov. So was it really genocide or was it not? I want you to just to look at the execution sites first. The Germans dis discovered the Katyn site and publicized it for their own aims, of course, while they were murdering Poles and Jews in Poland. Uh, this is the Katyn Cemetery Wall, the Polish remembrance of the tablet for each person. And this is how it links in Polish minds. This happens to be a demonstration in Opole, it's a Silesian town. Now, I wanted just to go into this genocide problem before going any further. If you look at Article 2, in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such, and all these things. So it's a very broad definition. And um, Polish lawyers, many of them, not all, say that this is a sufficient definition to classify the massacres of 1940 as genocide. But if you look at the criminal code of the Soviet Union, you will see that the vast majority of the Polish prisoners could be classified as guilty of counter-revolutionary crimes, any kind of opposition, criticism to the Soviet government, which Stalin identified with itself was a crime. This is the most famous article, and it had 13 sections. Uh, the last one are very often applied to Poles, I think, although we only have one extant file that wasn't destroyed. Under the Tsarist regime, this was used as justification to condemn the Polish policeman <laughs> who was born in 1912, so he would be six years old in the Civil War. But anyway, the point is, that according to the criminal code, which was in force until it was cancelled in 1958, counter-revolutionary crime to anybody who was opposed to the Soviet Union. And the investigations the NKVD carried out with the prisoners have made it quite obvious that they were so opposed. And this is the first Russian uh, language page of the famous Politburo decision, really, Stalin's decision on the basis of a very uh, resolution to shoot all the people. And this is in English. Counter-revolutionaries, you see, that was quite enough. Discovered members pertaining, etc., etc. There were, most of them, uh, members of the Polish army, but reserve officers. So you have several hundred positions, several hundred professors and teachers, many intellectuals and so on, which gave rise to the theory of the elite being Stalin aiming to kill the elite. Well, I think that was a, a byproduct. And then you have this, what was to be done with them. Now this includes the persons in the camps, it was a somewhat higher number than we have today. And then those in prison, actually uh, we happen to know from Russian documents published some years ago that the total number of prisoners shot was 7,300. Uh, about 4,000 of them have been identified because of the Ukrainian records for them. But those who had been held in Belarusian prisons and then moved elsewhere, we have no record and the Belarusian government doesn't um, cooperate. Well, going back to 2010, just immediately after the crash, you do have, here's 
Nefkoczynski, you do have a general united mourning at first. All the Poles united in mourning, a terrific shock, all the candles. It's a World War II helmet of the Polish underground army. And the memorial services were held in Warsaw and Premier Tusk spoke and all, every single one of the 96 victims had his picture and all the bodies were returned after identification in, in Moscow. And then, surprise, the burial of Lev Kaczynski and his wife in the Babel Castle, Cathedral of the Babel Castle, in a crypt there. Now this is a place, the crypts in the cathedral are reserved for famous people, military heroes like Piłsudski, Kościuszko, and uh, writers and artists. So why Lev Kaczynski, who was a politician, he had been president, president for a short time. And it, tur it, it turned out later that his brother, Yarek, the head of the party, had agreed on this with Cardinal G. Bishop Krakow as a way of honoring his brother. And most people thought, well, maybe this, this is strange, but let us honor the brother's grief. But actually, I think it was a political move because Jarek Kaczynski is lives for politics. He has no other interests in life. So anyway, people put up with it. And uh, this is one of the crypts that was Pisutsky and Pisutski and Sikorski. <laughs> Pisutsko was, of course, the hero of Polish and American revolutions. Pisutsky, uh Hero of Poland in the interwar, Poland and Brunner, sometimes called dictator, and General Sikorski, who was the Prime Minister of the Polish government in exile and until he died in a Gibraltar plane crash in 43. He's also Prime Minister. All well, this is the memorial procession. The President Medvedev came and made a nice speech and about several hundred heads of government came. Uh, President Obama could not because there was a volcanic eruption, if you remember, in Iceland. And uh, it, it was very dangerous to travel by air. So Medvedev came along and uh, made a nice speech. And I think here I would like to note that Medvedev took several steps in 2010, he was then a president, I think, of Russia, um, to improve relations with Poland. For instance, he published, it was on his initiative, I think, although Putin agreed with everything, of course, maybe was the initiator, on April 28, 2010, the Russian Security Service, FSB, website, published, I think it was 14 key documents, including the March 5th, 1940 decision of the Politburo to shoot the prisoners. That, that had been published in the Moscow Press in October 1992 by Yeltsin, also as part of the political internal battle in Russia. But this was accessible to so many people that the website broke down after a day or two and people had to wait. And then on November 28th of 2010, you have the Russian Duma making a very important declaration, condemning Stalin personally, which hadn't been done before, saying that the people killed, the Poles killed in 1940 were killed on Stalin's direct order, and that it was a crime. Well, and they also said these 
victims have been rehabilitated by history. History, well, not exactly a legal uh, thing. Well, in Poland, in June 2010, you have the presidential elections, and Jarek Kaczynski lost to Bronisław Komorowski who had been the speaker of the same, or the marshal of the same, and obviously also a supporter of Tusk and his civic platform party. So, in July of 2010, you have the beginning of tremendous protest demonstrations organized by peace, the Law and Justice Party, in the center of Warsaw in front of the presidential palace, and I'm sorry I don't have that, demanding, putting up a cross, and demanding that a monument be built to President Lech Kaczynski in front of the palace, accusing the Polish government of contributing, or even being the main, no, contributing to the catastrophe, oversight for not, not uh, looking after the Tupolev plane enough and the pilots enough, and particularly accusing Russia, and demonstrations in front of the Russian embassy. And this went on day after, every tenth of every month. Mm. And it's going on today in Warsaw. It's highly political, I mean, obviously, the people demonstrating uh, believe in what they're saying, but uh, most of the country is, I think most of the population is perplexed. Uh, there was a brief opinion survey carried out in the last couple of days, uh, organized by Gazeta Wyborcza, which is the I would say the liberal paper in Poland, although the peace people call it the post-communist or communist paper. <laughs> and uh, the results are interesting about, seems to be 32% uh, suspect, say that we really don't know the reports that have been published are going to it don't, are not clear enough, still things to be clarified. About 30% um, say that both the Russian and the Polish government are hiding something. <laughs> and about 18%, 18, 1, 8, believe in the conspiracy theory. So I think it's rather hopeful that it's only 18%, although still that's, that's rather high. Now, what about the reports on the crash. Well, the Russians came out with their report in January of 2011, and uh, it was uh, conclusive uh, in saying to the Russian side it was all the fault of the Polish pilot. None of the Russian control tower, nothing, airport, nothing. Well, um, this uh, really was uh, presented in Poland. The Polish um, reports, so two or three of them, <coughs> pointed out that the pilot uh, didn't have much experience of flying, I think he had 60 hours that he also had to double as a Russian language translator in communications with the control tower uh, at Smolensk Siviano Airport. Um, and we don't know if the crew was pressured to land or what. There was, uh, in the Russian report, there was a claim that uh, the head of the Polish Air Force, General Blasik, had gone into the cockpit and pressured the pilots to land. And also that the general was inebriated. The Polish, main Polish report said, no, we cannot identify the voice of the person in the cockpit. 
who was not a member of the crew. So we, we don't know, we don't think there is evidence of pressure. However, we have no record of the president of Poland saying, land or not land. We do have a record of the pilot asking, are we to land? Mm -hmm. And the answer is the president hasn't decided yet. And that was just before the crash. Also, the control tower advised the pilot not to land at Smolensk, but to land at nearby Vitebsk, which is only about 100 miles to the north, or in Minsk, which is further away. Now, I don't know what the state of Vitebsk is, whether it was any better, but at least it didn't have a fog on the ground. So it really looks like the pilots probably thought they had better try to land or the president would be upset. There were hundreds of relatives of families waiting already in the Katyn Cemetery. And so most unfortunately, tragically, pilot tried to land. The warning to go up, well, the control tower, uh, by the way, the control tower, there's a record of them telling them, you're on the flight path, you're OK. When they were not, <laughs> they were off in some ways. Um, and also telling them they were higher than was the fact. At the same time, I think the altitude instrument, as far as I remember, in the Tupolev may not have been working very well either. So together, this led to this terrible crash. Now, I was talking about Polish opinion being divided. The right-wing supporters uh, of Jarek Kaczynski and his party, the Law and Justice Party, first came up with the idea of a synthetic fog. <laughs> and they demanded an international investigation to prove this point. This must be a Polish joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Amazing. But then they gave this up, and now they are claiming that there were two bomb explosions on the plane between uh, just before it hit the birch tree, the birch tree on the left, which hit the wing, which caused the crash. And they produced two Polish American so called experts of metal on metal. Um, strength of metal, and they said that a big plane like that, it could not have crashed because of that little birch tree. There must be something else. <laughs> well, there were, but not, uh, not at all. The problem is that Medvedev yeah, promised that the wreck of the plane would be sent to Warsaw for investigation, and has not been sent, so it fuels the uh, the people who are not who are believing in a Russian conspiracy. Well, what about other things in Polish-Russian well relations? One more thing in Katyn, there is a on this by the Russian Memorial Association and the Polish government a series of demands, legal demands that have not been met. One is the legal classification of the crime and suggested it's a crime against um, humanity and a war crime, not genocide. Also, a demand for the individual rehabilitation of all the victims, not only at the three sites but also in the prisons. And there is also a, uh, some other demands for oh, accessibility to all the documents that have been collected by the Russian investigation, which was closed in 05, and even the motive for its closing is secret. So the families, some families, have been fighting in the Russian courts for uh, the same objects, objectives, and the answer of the courts is we cannot rehabilitate your relatives, 
because we do not have court records or the sentences. What is the paragraph of the Soviet law? Now, we happen to know that all the files of these people were destroyed in 1959. There's a document on that. It's in the book I co-edited, document 110, I think it's a, it's a note by the KGB head Shapilov to Khrushchev saying we have the files of all these thousands of people and they take up a lot of room and they may be embarrassing to our Polish friends, so let's destroy them. Um, apparently they were destroyed, although there is no order to destroy, there is no document, you can argue about it. But, uh, Memorial just recently said that they found, or they think there are documents in the FSB archive giving the order to be shot, at least that, but we don't know. So the families have appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, and on April 16th the court is to clear their plea, I don't know what it will say. At the same time there are Polish-Russian talks um, about getting around this, this legal problem. Um, to remove these legal obstacles. I, I personally think that they could only be removed by a decree of the Russian president. But I don't know if he'll ever do that. So, see a few more of these slides. This is the official Polish monument in Warsaw at the famous Pogonski Cemetery. Uh, this is Medvedev's visit to Poland in December of 10. And this is the government celebration in Warsaw. Even Kaczynski came to the memorial, although he had his own ceremony just as he has today. And this is a typical of the opposition. And the rejected truth poster is by the right wing. Their truth is that it's a Russian conspiracy. So at least they're in the minority, so that's something. Well, I'm sorry I took a little longer than I thought, but I'd be glad to answer your questions.